I mean, even to the extent where, where people last year were talking about 30% price falls. I mean, that that's so irresponsible to say that, given Australia has never seen 30% price falls. Because there's been a similar issue with industrial. It's one of the reasons they've grown so much in like face rent values, because you can't replace the buildings in the same value you once did. And it's obviously very um, margin sensitive, that industry. So if build costs went up 40%, then sort of the price needs to or the rents need to in time as well. I often get asked, like, when's, you know, is now a good time to buy? And it's like, well, yeah, of course, you know, property is a good investment and people have done very well over the long term, but fundamentally, is it the right time to buy for you? Do you have your finances? But can you get a good rate? What's the property you're looking at? Okay, everyone, how are you going? Phil Tarrant here. Welcome to Inside Commercial Property Rethink Investing. I'm your co-host and I got quite alarmed when I saw the brief for this particular podcast, 46 episodes Scott O'Neill, founder of Rethink Investing, 46 episodes we've done through the COVID pandemic, out of the COVID pandemic, and here we are. I know, it's. Uh, I'm shocked that it's that number, but uh, yeah, the years are what's scaring me now too. Like We've been doing it for three and a bit years, and yeah, time flies when you're having fun. The uh, world's different, well, business is different, we've uh, both been doing a lot of different things, it's been great, so yeah. See what the next three years brings. Well, it's good to see you got the brief with the white shirt, and I do know yeah. and people are going to be asking what's going on. It's the second time I've seen you over those three and a bit years with your arm in a sling. What's happening? Oh, uh, so you punched the out an agent, did you? Didn't get the right price. <laughs> oh, you're tempting sometimes. Yeah. No, no, they're all pretty good, but no, the elbow sec. Oh, it's the third surgery now, so they uh, had to put new tendons in the elbow because uh, it was loose the the second time. So. Okay. Don't break elbows. They're very complicated, and um, yeah, but it's meant to go back to ninety-eight percent of its usual function. So touch wood, if that happens, be very happy because it's been two years of having an average arm. So yeah, yeah, just to get back normal, that'd be great. We're quite fortunate that your job isn't on the end of a shovel or uh, something physical. Oh, so uh, you'd be uh, three months doing problems. nothing. Yeah. That's that's that would be a big problem. So business sure. continues, no, no changes, yeah. or everything's changing. Ah. Oh, well, let's, yeah, this is just a rapid year of growth. Like we're, uh, I think we're up to eight new employees already in the last couple of months. So we're, we've got more coming. It's, yeah, it's, it's full on. So yeah, lots of HR, lots of inductions, the usual growing pains you've got. But uh, we're seeing that there's going to be a lot more transactions in the commercial world. So there is been about two years of limited transactions due to everything that's happened. And we're, uh, we're now seeing the disparity between where the sellers want to sell and the buyers want to buy. That gap is the closest it's been for a long time. So transaction volume should grow quite rapidly. And they're off very low basis, by the way. So it doesn't need to grow much to have a good percentage increase. But we're trying to collect as much as that market as we can. So we're growing the business in line with where we're seeing the market. So this is why this, you know, we talk about the economy so much because as a business owner, you need to read it as much as an investor does. So we're getting ahead of it through uh, staffing up, essentially. Yeah, and I do note, and I've been a, an observer of your business for quite some time, and we are recording this on International Women's Days. You guys have great representation of female talent yep. inside of real estate, and I know you guys concentrate on that. But I think the industry can do more, personally, around attracting female talent into the industry. Yeah, we're, we're well over 50% represented by women, and I'd say in commercial particularly, like, it, there's very few in there, like especially in the sales agent division, it's um, terribly underrepresented and it does need to change because a lot of the, it just, yeah, it, it's just, it's a traditional industry that a lot of people kind of default to and I don't know why, like you look at this uh, residential markets, it's a lot more evenly spread and there's no reason why it should be the way it is in commercial. So it's changing, you see it, like I know the women we've got in our business, they do particularly well. And yeah, that's that's why uh, I, I'm surprised with the disparity. Like, you know, we, we, I have no idea what the stat is, but I'd feel like it'd be less than one in 10 sales agents would be female. Yeah, well, I think uh, I said they can do better, but if we're chatting about it, at least we're on the way in the pathway for doing it. But very quite serendipitous today because we have one of the most senior female operators in, in real estate joining us, uh, Nerida Connorsby. She's the chief economist over at Ray White Group. I've known Nerida for a number of different years, a number of different roles in for a number of years. Uh, most previously with REA, Nerida, how are you going? Welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. Now, I thought you were a residential property person, but it's become clear to me that you're 
more commercial. Your, your, your background is in commercial. That's where you you come up through the ranks uh, as a, a an economist around commercial property, and you pivoted into residential. So that was nice to know. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's been an interesting journey. I I started as an economist working with a company called Jeb Holland Demarzi, and we did a lot of forecast. I built forecasting models for customers like Westfield and uh, Lend Lease, all the all the listed property groups, and. Um, and so started there, then moved into agency and, and now residential. But yeah, tw- about 20 years in commercial property. So it, it was certainly where I, I learned a lot, a lot about property. And um, and Andy's also a passion of mine. I, I love watching what's happening. And, and also, I know, I know I feel like I know any, everyone in commercial property as well. Yeah. So it does feel a bit like family at times. Am I allowed to ask you what you prefer more, residential or commercial? Uh, I like both. I mean, residential is, is, is interesting because it does affect everyone and everyone's got a view and, um, and it's fast moving. You know, I think that's from a, you know, from a data perspective, there's always a lot of data and there's a lot, lot happening. And, you know, you look at Perth and you look at Melbourne, this, you know, things are quite different. Um, commercial though is far more complicated. It's the, the sectors are very diverse. I mean, if you compare a, an office building to a childcare center to, even you know, like a build to rent project, they're all, all very different. So, um, from that perspective, I do I do find it quite fascinating. But um, but it moves a bit slower, so I can I can kind of step in and out a lot more in in that sector compared to residential, where you know you miss one week and suddenly things have, have changed quite significantly. Yeah, and and it'd be risk of me not to ask you while while we have someone like yourself who has such a exemplar career inside of of real estate, we have a lot of female listeners to the podcast who are all trying to make a few bucks and create wealth through through uh, property, but what I see, and, and Scott sees quite a lot as well, um, is that a lot of people pivot from property being a, a wealth creation project into a, a career. What, what's what's some really good tips for, for females to make a mark in, in commercial real estate to, to move up through the ranks? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, we, we've been talking a lot about representation of women in commercial property, but it is changing. I mean, if, if I have a look back, you know, sort of 25 years ago there was there was very few women and um, we're starting to see that really changing so I I think one of the things that has changed is that people are required to be more educated coming into the sector so um, a lot more women studying property at university um, a lot more valuers a lot of women moving into commercial property do come through the valuation stream so you know, being good with numbers or, or you know understanding numbers is is really important. So I think that that education component is important. Um, also, even the if we have a look at a lot of the listed companies now have a lot of a, a lot of a, a, so a very big focus on trying to ensure more representation of women. The, the agencies as well, but they tend to be a little bit slower moving. But definitely the listed space. So you know there there are lots of avenues into it. But I think always the easiest way is to you know get educated, get to know people, and, and move in through that way. Yeah, my my view of it all is um, I think the intent is there, but. Uh, it needs to be, and I think there's a responsibility of a lot of the big listed players, superannuation funds and, and sort of connected agencies that support commercial growth to, to structurally promote and support change uh, and get behind it because uh, we need more females in the workplace, particularly in commercial property. Yeah, and I'll probably just do a shout out to the, prop, to the property council because I think they, in, in terms of my profile, they did a lot to really push me early on. They they did, they introduced a panel pledge to all of their events, and so, you know, we we went. I went from like being at the events and just always watching the same people to being invited to speak, and and that really changed the, the trajectory of my career. So I think you know groups like the property council have been very for, for commercial have been you know really important in, in ensuring and represent better representation. Well, now um, you're, you're relied upon by a lot of people to support decision-making with your insights around uh, economic predictions and the way in which Australia is evolving and changing and how that sort of interfaces with property. Do you sort of, that, the weight of that responsibility sometimes, do you ever sort of connect with it saying what you say and think can, and, and, and communicate can change what people do? It, it, I do, you know, I do, because I think it's particularly, I mean, commercial property is a little bit different because people do tend to be in the industry and um, across what's happening a little bit more. Uh, when we look at residential, though, you know, there's, I mean, even to the extent where, where people last year were talking about 30% price falls, I mean, that that's so irresponsible to say that given Australia has never seen 30% price falls and, um, and not specifying where, you know, I think, you know, 
when people hear that, they do get quite panicky and, and worried. So, you know, I think... I was going to ask you, sorry, to, um, yeah. on that, those 30% price falls, a lot of them come out of the bank's economic departments. Do you think there's any kind of motive or like... It, yeah, it just seems kind of quite creative that they come up with these massive predictions and they almost go the other way. Is there any sort of, I guess, angles, you know, there from an economic point of view or even a sales division point not. of view? <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I mean, that sort of, would be terribly irresponsible, yeah. but I hope not. I mean, I think it's more sort of headline grabbing. I, I gotcha. think, you know, if you come out and say 30% price fall, you know, the media will immediately pick up on yeah. that and publish it. So, you know, I think... I think too, there's that a lack of understanding around property markets, particular. I mean, commercial obviously because it's difficult to understand, but residential because people will look at interest rates and think there's this you know one one to one link between what happens yeah. to interest rates, but you know ignore the fact that Australia is growing and construction costs are blowing out, and you know we've we've had rental growth which is never been seen, you know, the highest rental growth we've ever seen. So, you know, there's been such major change and such pressure on pricing, which which I think a lot of these forecasters really ignore. Yeah. We're, we've been given a hard time over the last sort of three years. I think we've, we've caught it pretty well. You know, we've been caught up in the in, in the, uh, the noise and the EDC sometimes around predictions around price growth. Um, uh, but the point is, is that a lot of people rely on on information to make decisions around investing and and there's still this this hangover of and i still hear it every day of everyone saying well we were told interest rates weren't supposed to go up to 2024 and therefore we made decisions based on that premise so so there is a, a responsibility and accountability from from economists but knowing what i know and knowing quite a, a lot of economists senior economists is that you know there's no bias or agenda they try and get it right but there's a lot of things out of their controls and they can't telegraph the future sometimes yeah, I mean, and that interest rate call was a hard one too because the our Reserve Bank themselves were saying that they didn't expect rates to rise and, and, and their view wasn't inconsistent with global views of, of different banks, so of different central banks. So, yeah, that was a, probably one of the, the worst. Yeah, it'll go down in history as a real clang a bit. So, so while we've got you, uh, Nerida, um, I'm conscious of time and, and I reckon we're going to end up sort of debriefing after this podcast saying, oh, we should have asked her about this and the other. So if we miss stuff... Uh, we apologise, but um, you can send all your questions. Uh, we can probably get follow-up, Scott. Uh, you can do it through uh, the Rethink uh, Facebook page and we'll give, put some uh, details in the show notes. But what we've got, you want to chat about inflation today? You want to chat about interest rates? Um, obviously, property prices. And we want you to sort of telegraph the future for us when it comes to commercial property. But um, uh, inflation, uh, it's probably on the downward cycle of running it's through this uh, this heightened period, uh, getting it under control. What's your views? Yeah, it's definitely coming down. Monthly inflation was at three point four percent for January, so Reserve Bank are trying to get to between two and three percent. So we're, we're you know we're getting there. The big the big one, of course, has been construction costs are starting to come back. That was such a problem. All those block supply chains are becoming have have become unblocked. So that's a, a big one. Um, I think one of the challenging aspects of inflation uh, has been the, the rental growth that we've mm-hmm. seen and rent, rents do feed into inflation. It's been a big component of, of the growth in, in, in the CPI and one of the problems we have with it is that uh, the reason rents have increased is that there's not enough homes being built and increasing interest rates make fewer homes being built. So there's yep. been a bit of a circular problem with um, with what's been happening to inflation, but but definitely coming under control. We've got, it's a very different outlook compared to where we were at the end of last year. Once that November rate rise came in, there was a view that rates would probably go up again because inflation wasn't coming down quick enough. But by the time we hit December, you know, we started to see a, a much greater improvement in conditions. And what are we seeing with the current like construction costs? What, like, why do you think that was lagging uh, you know, it was so much higher, you know, in terms of sort of the other indicators out there. Because it's still quite high, isn't it? The hasn't come back. Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been terrible. You know, it's been such a, a shock and um and that was just a combination of factors. So uh in twenty twenty two the the cost of building a new home, which is what CPI tracks, dr- jumped twenty percent. So we, mm-hmm. we saw a jump of twenty in twenty percent in construction costs. But even worse in worse in Queensland, it jumped thirty percent. Um, places like Perth, we saw you know much higher increases. So, um, and it's just a combination of factors. It was materials. So we we had a shortage of materials. We had um, a shortage of labour. So a lot of labour, um, particularly foreign labour, went went 
went back overseas during the pandemic. So, so that was a problem, trying to get that labour yeah. back in. Uh, and then there was productivity problems because if you if you consider on a building site, if you've you know you're putting in a bathroom and and the bath doesn't arrive, then your the, the timing of your project blows out from one week to three months while you're waiting for the bathroom. So there was this lag in in a lot of projects that that hadn't hadn't you know wouldn't have occurred if the, if the supply chains were unblocked. Yeah, and then the the company's going bust. So you know that was again we started to see a lot of companies go under because costs had gone up and they're on fixed price contracts. So it was a yeah. this really terrible situation. Because there's been a similar issue with industrial because one of the reasons they've grown so much in like face rent values and um, even just construction costs have really pushed those up because you can't replace the buildings at the same value you once did. And it's obviously very um, margin sensitive, that industry. So if build costs went up 40%, then sort of the price needs to or the rents need to in time as well. So yeah, that's that's what uh, you know we've been hearing from developers on the ground. They just can't make ends meet and... Over the last few years, there's been a, a lack of supply, even though the market's got quite strong from a tenant point of view. So I guess that's a question. Where do you see the industrial side of things going on in the next few years now that rents, um, like they're, they're still growing at, uh, you know, I think I checked, 10.8% uh, annualised right now as of um, quarter one in uh, 2024. So it's still growing quick. So do you see that kind of starting to, to cool down at some point? Yeah, I mean, industrial is a fascinating one because, you know, early on in my career, it was kind of the the, the low growth one. It was a high yield. Mm. You know, everyone was very private investor. We didn't have much institutional investment, but, but that's changed. Uh, I think in terms of growth, it, it's still the darling of commercial property. It's still, you know, if you look at the MSCI data on total returns, it is still seeing positive returns. Where if you look at office and retail, it's, you know, in, in negative depending on, on what sort of se- where, where you are and what sector of the market you're looking. But, you know, fundamentally industrial is the, you know, the asset class of the future that so much of what we need is is needs warehousing and mm. we're shopping online more than we ever used to. Grocery shopping has been sort of the sticking point for, for online retailing, but that's increasingly going to go online like it has elsewhere around the world. So that's one component. Uh, if you have a look at driverless cars, if they ever emerge, they're yeah. going to have to park somewhere. You look at food manufacturing, that needs warehousing. Uh, and then uh, what, what we were talking about before around construction costs, that one of the challenges we have for all sorts of property and applies to to industrial, applies to residential um, and, and many other asset classes is that the cost of replacement now is so much higher and so that does force up the values of existing facilities and, and we're seeing that absolutely in industrial and we're definitely seeing it in residential as well. Yeah, interesting. When, when, when do you think the conversation around inflation is going to be normalised and we won't be talking about it anymore? End of the year, for okay. sure. You know, I th- if it's sitting at 3.4% in January and it starts to get below 3% in the next few months, I, th- I think at that point it, it will be a, a non, you know, it will be something we don't talk about. I mean, we never used to really talk about it. No, but it's much. become, it's, it's it, rather than talking about property at dinner parties now, you talk about inflation. Yeah. Um, so, so it'll have to come normalised at some point and that will cascade into what happens with, with interest rates. But yes. before we get to interest rates, can you give me a sense for the, sort of the global shocks that are happening at the moment, these seismic, you know, actions happening outside of our borders and the implications around commercial property and uh, you know, everyone's sort of familiar now, the war in Ukraine is dragged on two years and, and that will continue for quite some time. Um, you have Houthi rebels disrupting the Red Sea and shipping costs are getting expensive. How much does that actually impact Australia when it comes to commercial property? Yeah, it has varying impacts. I mean, Ukraine has been interesting in that Ukraine is a, a big producer of wheat and food. So so that's had an impact on global... I mean, I'll, I'll talk about wheat because it's such a big component of, of Australian agricultural production, but... That really forced up the price of wheat last year and we produce a lot of wheat. It's a big component. And also last year we produced a, a much more wheat than we normally did because our weather was so good. So so we did, as a country and many state economies did really well last year because of Ukraine mm-hmm. and the fact that wheat prices went up. Uh, in terms of the war, um, you know, obviously shipping costs is a big one. I mean, it's not, it's not so bad as – it's not as bad as COVID – but it does have an impact. It definitely impacts oil prices. So 
oil prices at the moment, they, you know, they, they fluctuate such a lot. But a lot of the, the increases that we've seen have, have been because OPEC have said, OK, we're restricting production. We don't want prices to fall, so we're going to make it expensive. And then you have other parts of some of the countries in OPEC going against that. So then they flood the market with oil. And so, you know, that has an impact, makes it cheaper again. So, you know, there's a lot that we really can't predict in terms of behaviour of certain countries. So so definitely oil prices, definitely food production, it, it influences. And and then I guess the disruption that we're seeing everywhere, it, it does impact confidence as well. I mean, I think Australia, we're so lucky because we're so... We're so isolated in many ways and, and you know, the, glo- the, the economy is, is linked globally, but from a lot of the turmoil that's being experienced, we, we you know, we're not impacted as much as, say, Europe with, with their gas crisis mm-hmm. and, you know, their, their fear of what's happening with Russia. We're not as impacted as, as those areas. So, so to put all of this in, in a perspective, um, we, we, we operate in around real estate and talk about this stuff all the time, so... You think that it's really important right now. It's maybe more heightened than what it has been before. This cycle that we're currently in, um, with you know shocks in influencing inflation or the the, the drivers of economic growth here or, or accessibility to products or services here, you know you've you've got these things happening all the time. Is this just normal? Can you give us some perspective to it? Is it normal and just get used to it? There's always going to be something that changes stuff. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think this is a, the the advice to investors is that, you know, there's just stuff you can't control and fundamentally you do need to be aware of risk and you do need to consider your personal circumstances. And this is a question that I often get asked, like, when, you know, is now a good time to buy? And it's like, well, yeah, of course, you know, property is a good investment and people have done very well over the long term, but fundamentally is it a right time to buy for you? Do you have your finances in order? Can you get a good rate? What's the property you're looking at? And a lot, most of the time that is more important than, than actually when you buy. And I think this is, you know, coming back to a lot of the, the media that comes out around um, house prices and, you know, that, that people do put off decisions based on, on what comes out in the media. And, and I think with property, the best advice generally is just to get in as soon as you can because we know that Australia is growing. We know there's going to be demand for housing. We know there's going to be demand for industrial property and commercial property over time. So, you know, really trying to just get into the market is, is, is the best I, thing. I, I'm really happy you framed it that way because uh, the, the cynic would say economists are just there for uh, coming up with the, the next thing that drives uh, media headlines. So it's good to see a nice considered approach to the practicality of property investing. And one of the reasons why, why myself and Scott joined forces with this podcast is to try and shape some sensibility around decision making with property investment and my view and Scott's views no doubt is if you can afford to invest in property now is always the right time to invest in property so it's good to see there's a a cohesive sentiment towards sensibility around property investing. Yeah exactly and uh, like you said Nerida a lot of these uh, are just headline grabs from small parts of these reports you guys make and then uh, you know like the you know the high level numbers and that's what gets uh, thrown through the mainstream and and you're right, these decisions are based, made on, like, I know there can be, a, a you know, a, a current affairs story and the next day our demand drops off, depending, like, it has that much of an impact. More yeah, residential. You can, you can actually map that, can you? You actually see it just... You know, more in our early days when we we're more yeah. residential sensitive focus. But, yeah, no, it generally has uh, quite a major impact on confidence. Like, if there's a, a major media headline saying there's a crash coming, uh, you can lose contracts on the on the day like based on a third party decision maker like that but you know and and especially all these inflation figures in the recent times there's been a lot of people um you know when the i remember that period where it started to look like it was coming down a bit and then it went up again um yeah investor and this is even in commercial the confidence cooled in that period but i've always been of the opinion like high inflation long term is kind of a good thing for commercial investors because it's almost you know, it's going to push rents up, means less supply. It's, you know, it's going to, it's going to give you a kind of a, a better picture long term. Like I think low inflation for long periods of time is not good for capital growth, is it? Yeah, well, I suppose too that if the Reserve Bank are cutting interest rates, it mainly, means the economy is cooling too much. So we, we saw GDP figures come out last week and uh, it was it was low, you know, it was, it was 0.2%. So it's, we're not in, in we're not heading to in, to a recession 
it doesn't look like we're heading to recession anytime soon. But fundamentally, if, we, if they need to, to cut rates, it means they're trying to, to you know, generate activity. So, you know, there's there's always that, that flip side to it. Yeah. So well, let's chat about rates. But beforehand, Scott, you, you spoke about um, investor confidence, commercial investor confidence, and, and maybe they don't get their jitters as much as what resi investors do, largely because they're a bit more sophisticated. They've probably been around property a little bit longer and, um, and and they've got the experience of investing through resi property before they transition. But where, where, give me a gauge for for commercial confidence right here, right now. Is it is it positive or negative from a from a sort of central line? Uh, from dealing with current, like our clients currently, yeah. it's as high as I've seen it for oh, since pre interest rate rises. So okay. And that's why we're, you know, like I mentioned before, we're staffing up at the moment. We're seeing um, the gap between where the, I guess, the sellers are in terms of yield and the buyers are. That's the closest it's been. So there is deals happening. Um, there's the talk of the interest rate drop whenever that is. It almost doesn't matter. It's just the talk of it, which is getting people excited. Gives you the impression there's a window of an opportunity of best buying conditions because you don't want to buy after the rates have dropped. Because uh, naturally, sellers will increase their you know expectations on price like that day. So if you get in early, cop the higher interest rates for you know a period of time, you are you know theoretically you should get a better deal. So the sophisticated guys think like that, and we're seeing uh, yeah lot, our transactions are, are increasing. We've got um, you know even just from a company point of view, two and a half times the signups per per week. These are new clients, and they're you know on average take about three to six months to settle on a property. So, you know we're seeing a window up to six months into the future with these guys. And uh, yeah, as I said, it's about two to two point five times the volume of new clients compared to the same time last year. So it's definitely busier. And with that balance with with what you're seeing forward forecasts and. You know, having a, a finger on the pulse, kind of like the ground truth meets the numbers and insights. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little bit harder with commercial because it's so diverse, mm. but definitely last year seemed to be the worst. And in terms of sentiment and even t- terms of performance, I think even sectors that were pretty strong from a tenant demand perspective weren't doing that well from a value perspective because there was a lot of negativity around. So I do think last year was probably the worst. I think now people are seeing what the impact of, of COVID has been. Commercial was a bit delayed. You know, I think that's that's the other issue that residential was quite quick. You know, we could see the impact on values. You know, we could see what was happening with rents, with commercial a lot of the, the rents are locked in for, you know, three, five, even 10 years. And so, you know, they, those rents were, you know, pe- tenants were continuing to pay rents even though they may not have decided to occupy the building once they, they that lease was under you know, up for renewal. So it did take a little bit longer, but it does seem that last year was, was seen as the worst. I remember seeing a report from Ray White showing the total transaction volumes. And I, I, I thought it was... A typo, like it was down over seventy yeah. percent from the two thousand and twenty one peak. Like it's unbelievable how how quiet the industry <laughs> got after that peak. It was yes. So so that data is from Real Capital Analytics. So they track every single sale that's undertaken and um, yeah, it's quite shocking. It's shocking to see that chart because it, it really flew up during the pandemic that commercial property transactions skyrocketed and mm. And it was, I mean, this is a thing too with property. We saw it, we, we saw it in commercial, we saw it in residential, is that one of the things that does hold up values is that people hold on during bad times, that yep. people are better educated now. They don't panic sell like they used to. And I think that's, you know, that's really apparent that, particularly for resi, that, you know, you can quite quickly see when people are panic selling, but people haven't and they are now more conscious that the bad times get better and, you know, to hold property is a better idea than to try and transact and get it, get out and then try and get back in again. Yeah, and that's one of the great arguments when someone says, oh, it's going to drop 30%, especially in commercial. You know, chances are the guy or girl has a 50% plus deposit in the asset because you need to go minimum 30% down and then maybe a couple of years of growth on it. You've, uh, you're well over the 50% cash mark. There's no reason just to quickly drop the price and sell. You, like their cash flow is probably better. You just hold through these periods, and that's exactly why that transaction volume was 70% down because people just don't need to sell. Absolutely. It's funny too looking at who was buying and selling last year that um, I don't know if we'll be talking about this later, but talking about the privates and how active yeah. they were last year that they were the net 
buyers of, of commercial property, which during the pandemic they were net, net sellers. And, and we do see that every cycle that because privates can make decisions a lot quicker, they do tend to swoop in during times of price drops because they can see the opportunity. They don't have investment committees they have to go through and the, and the like, like the listed groups. So last year the people who were selling were the, the listed groups that are under pressure from shareholders and, and their boards to, to make decisions and, and move quickly and – and, you know, they're the ones that, you know, I mean, they, I'm, I'm sure they're well-run, they're obviously well-run companies, but, you know, they're the ones that transacted and, and the privates are the ones that really took took the opportunity to buy stock last year. Well, one thing I've noticed uh, through this last period and sort of a sense towards the, the confidence level is um, uh, the, the, the sort of notion is heightened more than ever before that not all asset classes are created equal. Um, and, and you see this divergence in prices for resi, uh, houses versus units is just growing, and you see the same inside of commercial with industrial versus, say, uh, offices. Um, do, do you think we're going to get back to some more similarity between asset classes? You know, houses, units, and industrial office and 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 retail coming closer together, or do you reckon this is going to be a structural shift that's going to remain? Well, I guess um, the houses unit one is is clearly around land value. That mm. you know, in the end, land land is is where the value is is held. So if you've got a block of land with one house on it versus a block of land with 20 apartments and one apartment is, is probably not going to increase as much as that as one house. So um, the house and unit one is interesting though because if you have a look at uh, a house, I mean I always use the example, a house and a, an apartment in, in, an, in within one suburb, will, the house will do better. But if you have a look at an apartment in say Mossman and you compare it to a house in, I mean, I don't want to pick on any one suburb, but just say Blacktown, you know, the house, the, the apartment in Mossman's probably going to do better than the house in Blacktown. So there there are differences. And, and so I think that's that's probably the other thing that you have to look at when you are investing the units in, in a, many in a, urban areas do quite well and are a worthwhile investment. Um, with commercial, though, structure, it's definitely structural. I mean, if, you, if I think over my career back, you know, when I started, shopping centres were like, Totally, you know, they were seen as, for, you know, people use terms like fortress-style investments. That they were so, such good investments and there was, you know, there was no gloom in the horizon because, they, you know, there was population growth in Australia and retail spending kept growing. Sometimes it dropped off, but then it came back again. And there was all these things around shopping that no one expected to change. And then online shopping came on and, and that did change. So that, that really changed the conditions. Uh, industrial, you know, the industrial, even, I mean, industrial has changed so much that, you know, the industrial agents 20 years ago were are so different to the industrial agents now that, you know, they've, they've, they have to be far more sophisticated. They're, mm. they're, they're dealing with institutional investors now. They're not just, you know, the, the deals are becoming more complicated. The tenant requirements are becoming more complicated. So industrial's really changed. And then office, I mean, oh, it was interesting. I did a, a presentation, I think it was the day after lockdown, I was presenting an event. And so you know, I had my slide pack and I was like, it was on commercial. I was like, oh, damn, like everything's changed. I had to, you know, scramble around thinking, well, what what does this mean? And and commercial, I didn't, office, I did, that was the one I just didn't predict because I thought people would be back in the office within a few weeks. And then obviously we didn't go back into the office for quite some time and it had such a fundamental impact. And, you know, office was really seen as a, very stable, very safe asset class, but that's that's really changed with what's happened during the pandemic. Yeah, I, I, so we're recording uh, this podcast in Sydney, and um, and when I come here in a taxi today, sort of reflecting in hindsight, I, I was looking around and I, I didn't really get it until I've just thought about it now. It was really a microcosm of real estate and the economy in Australia. At, at the top end, you've got uh, big development with the new um, uh, the metros. There was buildings with scaffolding all around the commercial properties, which um, retail and, and office, there was a lot of hotel developments and has come further down, got a bit humdrum and there was a lot of empty places and it looked like no one wanted to be there. And and, and to me, it was just reflective of the economy meets uh, government and infrastructure spending decisions, meets habits and behaviours around commercial property investing until we get to where we are now, which was, again, quite nice. Um, and it just got me thinking the, the, the mechanism of, uh, interest rates is a driving force for most property decision making, both at an inside level but at a private level. Uh, so everyone's sort of hanging on the end of their seats right now, thinking when are interest rates going to start coming down? Because that will be a, a catalyst for for changing sentiment, and changing growth, and access to money and capability to invest in property. 
are we going to be able to get you to tell us exactly when interest yeah. rates are going to start <laughs> coming down? So I, I mean, there's many ways you can forecast interest rates. You can kind of just make a call, mm. you know, oh, well, yeah. I reckon it'll be May or, you know, whatever. Um, you can build a model and, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of my career building models, so I know how sensitive they are to particular assumptions. So you can build a model or alternatively, which um, is my preferred method, is looking at the ASX interest rate futures mm. index. And I think that that is good because people actually have money invested in where that futures index goes. So they're actually putting money down on where they expect interest rates. And I, th- I think that's, you know, when you've got skin in the game, that, that does change your, your view and your behaviour quite significantly. I was actually following the ASX futures just in the last lead up. They were predicting a 16% uh, chance of a cut in the March quarter, and then it dropped down a few days down to, in, to 5%. And I don't know what it is today, but uh, yeah, you can see how much it really flows depending on the variables of the day. Yeah, and that's it. It's a daily look. You know, that's you can run your models daily, but you're still using the same data in yeah. most cases. But you know, this does give you a, a daily live look. feed. Yeah. yeah, it's a live feed. So yeah, so I'd look at it, obviously look at it closely. But at the moment, that's saying I think a cut in sort of around July, um, another cut sort of before the end of the year, and then a third cut early next year. So. That's the market now. It, it could change. I mean, we know how quickly it can change. I mean, if you look again, going back to December, it, it was, you know, that that rate hike in November, everyone was thinking, oh, there'll be another one in February. You know, we had people saying, yeah, that for sure is going to happen. And then February went by and there was, we're, we're talking about cuts at this point. So, yeah, I, I think, I think we will, you know, I mean, so my view is we will see cuts this year mm. and, even if inflation doesn't get below 3%, I'm sitting at 3.4%, so it probably will get below 3%, but given the economy is barely growing at this point, mm. the Reserve Bank do need to move because it takes a while for those cuts to flow through. So they don't want to leave it too late and push us into recession. Okay. So when? Uh, I <laughs> think the earliest... Uh, does d- 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 the sort of corporate say... Don't make too. No, don't be pretty, too specific. No, you, you, you're diverted to the ASX. In, uh, no, they're pretty. They do. They actually, they don't pull me up at all. No, so, I mean, they go for it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice place to be. But yeah. the earliest I think they'll go is May, and the reason being is that um, monthly inflation is coming at three point four percent, but that doesn't use all the data. And the next time we get quarterly inf- inflation will be late April. The next board meeting will be May after that. So if that is down 3% or below, I think at that point they'll make a cut. So and, I think it's May the earliest. The I'll Aussies be. popping champagne corks thinking, <laughs> here we go. What do you think, Scott? I hope it's not that early. Okay. Uh, just from a, way. Yeah, it's just the reason like it's going to, I guess I run a buyer's agency business. We want to be buying well for longer periods of time. It will push prices up at least – from the vendor expectation point of view as well, you know, they'll see it. And, um, you know, I saw uh, a video that Tom Panos did, um, who we both know quite well, and he said he was in an auction and there was 13 auctions he did and three of them, the vendors, because of all the talk, all this chatter about interest rate uh, drops, they actually raised the reserve on the day for no reason other than that chatter. Mm. So I, I fear that'll happen with commercial property because any excuse to ask for more money it's a good excuse. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, so May soon, like that's like, yeah. Nice. I was hoping a longer window. So, um, so yeah. you say so on that basis. Then, if it is May, yeah, have you missed it? As in this purple patch for buying commercial property? No, because a lot of the vendors weren't meeting the price anyway because okay. the volumes are down. So they've come down more this year. So there's more link ups with sales and transaction volumes. So the the value is is there for the investors more than it was late last year. Um, I think, like, my prediction is it'll be a bit later than May just because I, I don't know, and I'm not, like, narrative, you know, looking at the stats every day, but it just feels so soon. And I know, you know, it's – the market is, is – yeah, I don't know. It, it's almost like it'll cause more problems potentially, at least from my space with, you know, the rents and people paying more from a property point of view. But I'm not following, you know, what OPEC's doing and – you know, or you know how long it takes to transport something out of uh, China or or Europe. So, you know, they're all the inflation side. I've got no idea about. But from a property point of view, it's going to be putting more upward pressure on prices, and rents aren't slowing down anyway. So we're going to be in this environment of high growth for both values and rent, uh, and they're not building enough as well. So it's a long term problem. 
it's um yeah it's going to be a period of time which most values will go up and if they push rents down sorry rates down it's just going to it's literally going to speed the problem up yeah and we're going to move into a cycle probably relatively unique a lot of australian investors or the average aussie on the street will probably think it's housing days for banks sort of making record profits because interest rates are so high but i'm speaking to a lot of banks senior people in banks and uh they're crying poor already around the, the the cost of funds and and i don't think banks are going to be quick to pass on interest rate savings to australians Do you have a view on that oh, i'm sure they'd Do like not to yeah. but i i i think there'll be a lot of pressure on on them to do that. Well, we're I mean, starting very, it now, sort of any time yeah. I get a chance to give it. But um, yeah, they were very quick to pass on the increases, so I think it would be seen as a bit um, unfair if they didn't pass on the cuts. Yeah, and I think I think they'll get a lot of um, pressure from government also because yes, you're going to get pressure. this intersection of a, a decreasing rate environment nearing and coming up to a, a federal election. So uh, I would imagine there'll be a lot of weight placed on lenders to pass it on, whether or not they'll do it at the same speed as the cuts. But uh, We'll have some fun talking about it. and that. That'll have a catalyst for how people's um, uh, attitudes and sentiments towards commercial property evolves, whether or not they can access debt and whether or not that debt is at a level which meets prices. It probably takes us to a, a bit of a discussion around property prices. Um, as rates start coming down, do you see rapid price growth is driven by increased demand and turnover? Or give me a sense for that supply and demand equation. Yeah, so I guess, well, maybe I'll start with Resi and then we can talk commercial. I mean, Resi, we can, saw last year prices increase by 10%, and that was in a rapidly rising interest rate environment. So this year, we've, we've got, under similar conditions, we still have a shortage of housing, we've still got construction problems. Population growth will slow a bit, but that's, you know, that so that may have a, a bit of a, a, a leavening effect. But fundamentally, you know, we'll probably see, if, if we see rate cuts, we'll probably see prices grow by more than 10%. I mean, if we have a look at the start of this year, I mean, we're only two months in, so it's a little bit, you know, a simple extrapolation of two months into the full year would give us price growth of about 15%. So, yeah, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if resi prices increased by more than 10%. I think for commercial, it, it will depend on the sector. And uh, if you have a look at office, it will probably stabilise things a little bit. I mean, prices have been coming back a lot and there's, there's low levels of, of uh, transactions taking place. I think industrial is quite different because the tenant demand situation is so strong. So that combined with lower rates will push up pricing quite a bit. So talking about the office market, there seems to be a lot of development around office and it's a big investment. So our offices are in North Sydney. There's, there's offices going up all over the place. So you know, this, this is sort of... Sort of centric view of of most investors stay away from from office based investing because the demand isn't there. We're still trying to r- rationalise what what the world of work looks like into the future with work from home and and the government now. There's discussion around mandating it that that it's you have to provide that as a a right of the Australian worker, uh, which is going to be very polarising. Why are people building so many commercial office towers when office markets on the nose? Can can you explain it? Yeah, I guess it's the pipeline. You know, the, these projects take a long time. The lead up so long, and so a lot of these were really planned off well before the pandemic. So that that's part of the problem. That they're just long term projects that take a long time to to get up out of the ground. So that's a big big one. Also, the other the other issue is around if you look at CBD office, the performance of that's quite different to say the performance of suburban office and then different again to regional office. And not all office markets are doing badly. If you have a look at somewhere like the Gold Coast, the, the office markets are really strong. So any any regional area where you've seen a lot of population growth, they're doing quite well in terms of, of their performance. CBD, the problem at the, now is, is, as you said, the high levels of construction taking place, people not wanting to come into the office. Mm. And also government is a problem because there's no... Government is a really big occupier of office space and they're not requiring their staff to come in. So, you know, it is a battleground issue because people quite like working from home and, you know, there's there's a lot of challenges trying to get people back I, in. I right? still don't know how it's going to play out. When, when <laughs> I don't know. A, when the government isn't incentivising its own workforce and, and they were they were the government, that's a bit of a catch-all, yes, right, you know, for, for local, state and, yeah. uh, and, and federal and this is not a... A beat up on government, but um, uh, they were quick to say uh, small business is suffering because these micro economies, whether it's big CBDs or 
or satellite CBDs are, are struggling because there's no workers in the office and therefore it's stifling um, uh, local economies, you know, dry cleaners, coffee shops, restaurants, all and sundry, uh, which has ramifications for commercial property investors as well because that's probably where a lot of your clients would operate, maybe sort of not the big, they're not buying the big institutional blocks, they're probably the, the, the peripheral assets that sit in and around it. Um, it, it is a, is a, it's a huge structural issue I think Australia has right now and it gives no certainty for anyone around the office market right. moving forward. And, and on that basis, I'm not, I'm not touching office so I'd, until it works its way out and I think it's going to take some time. And no doubt that's a recommendation you're giving to your clients. Yes and no. Um, See, it's a loaded question, Yeah, that's it? a loaded. Because <laughs> like, I like what Nerida said. She um, mentioned it's not all equal. So even the CBD office market, like one of the best ones right now is Brisbane. So prime office buildings in Brisbane, um, their vacancy rate's less than 6%. You know, compare that to one of the worst markets in the Sydney, which would, in the country, which would be Melbourne secondary assets. That's sitting at about 19% vacancy. So well, We had a question recently from, from someone specifically around this, around commercial the, the implications, the impact of Brisbane commercial property, particularly with it looking forward to the Olympics coming. In. Brisbane's quite strong, yeah. and um, like the rents in the last twelve months have grown eleven percent for prime buildings in Brisbane. So that's a really good equation for anyone that bought a building twelve months ago. And you know, like with all the you know population growth and the uh, Olympic Games coming up, and the fact that people may end up back into the office or the you know immigration levels you know, or net migration levels overseas, like this, you know, maybe it's a counter-cyclical play in some areas. So I, I like watching the vacancy rates quite closely. Like I wouldn't touch most of the CBD markets just due to the massively higher vacancy rates, but those tighter ones, like that's almost, you can start calling the bottom in that. And you're getting, uh, especially from a historic point of view, probably the best per square meter versus industrial versus retail that you've ever had because office used to be the darling you know that you know, not like not industrial, and uh, no saying it's going to stay like that forever. So yeah, I, I agree with you, Phil. I probably wouldn't buy most uh, properties that have office in it, but regional office, it's you know they've got the best fit outs and ten, tend to have the best tenants. So I wouldn't just go. I'd rather an empty shed for the same money, like when you've got a great tenant and a higher spec fit out next door to it. Like you know, you still got to look at that case by case. And so we're talking about what's going to happen with, with property prices. Um, I, I don't know if you ever do this because I've got a large-ish property portfolio and whenever I get frustrated with property or get annoyed with it or I'm sick of paying interest rates and stuff, I, I've got to sit there and put it into a capital compounding capital growth calculator and I sort of put it all in and I press a couple of buttons and I play around with 5%. You know, it's good to hear that resi property, I've got a lot of resi, is going to keep growing. It sort of a, a realigns and reconnects me with all the reasons why property is such a good asset class and 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 the um the, the growing sort of disparity between your your interest rates and and the growth in your asset and what you can do with that in time right so every single property investor is concerned about capital growth and prices so you spoke about um resi and i sort of concur with a lot of your sentiments there and i think uh, not all resi property and, and locations are created equal so be careful where you do invest but we spoke very briefly about office markets there can you give me a sense for price growth in um, and what you're seeing, and maybe you can come up with a couple of different um, areas around specifically industrial, because I think that's where the main game is, and and what's happening at retail. Uh, with retail as well, yeah, shopping centres, yeah. So um, retail, I mean, again, you know, coming back to everything, every asset's different, and every location's different. Shopping online, obviously, is is the future, and we are shopping more online retail's changing the thing with retail though is again you know a location can really change the outlook and if you have a look somewhere that where you're seeing a lot of population growth I mean, it doesn't have to be an urban fringe population growth area but if you suddenly put up you know if you have a look at some of the transit oriented development that the government's trying to put through if you put an extra 500 residents into quite a small area that dramatically changes the outlook for that retail precinct around there. So I think if you are looking at r retail, looking at what the future changes are to population growth is really important. Changes too to the demographic profile. If you've got an ageing population, you start to get a lot of younger people in so that urban regeneration can r rapidly change the outlook for a retail shopping strip as well. So mm. there is a lot to consider and and then also, if 
you know, coming back to southeast Queensland, I mean, that, that area is, is booming at the moment. There's so much population growth. It's the highest, the highest level of interstate and international migration ever recorded for that, that part of Australia. So adding that many people into a whole region of a state is, is dramatically changing the amount of retail spending. And we can, and we can really see it in the, in the restaurants that have been built in, in places like Brisbane, that Brisbane restaurant scene has exploded because there's all these all these people with all their money and it's you know people are just spending more and, and that really changes the, the outlook and industrial well industrial is you know coming back to what we spoke about earlier is is around the changes to how much we require more industrial property and we're not building you know sorry we are we are the cost of building is increasing but the, the land, you know, just land runs out. So you just got to keep pushing out. And so that, that does just increase the cost of industrial. And then you've got encroaching residential development. So if you have a look at a lot of industrial areas close to the cities, they're, they're changing too now and they're becoming more valuable because they're the, the changes that are taking place. I live on the northern beaches in Sydney. So if you have a look at somewhere like Brookvale, which was very much a, you know, a cabinet makers and you know, panel beaters and, you know, sort of traditional retail. Now it's just it bars. It's just bars, yeah. Mm-hmm. So breweries. You've just got yeah. <laughs> breweries. And you've now got restaurants and now they're changing the zoning. So, you know, if you if you had bought there, you know, 20 years ago, you probably wouldn't have paid much. But if you're on a site where they've decided, you know, you can build a 20-storey residential development, that rapidly changes the value of your And, and Brookvale's a really good case in Brooklyn. So I want to sort of ask you, which markets will perform and which markets won't perform. And so uh, I know Brookvale quite well. How do you find the next Brookvale? Yeah, how do you find it? I think you, I, it's it's a lot around any of those inner urban industrial areas. I mean, it, it, it happened in Fitzroy. It happened in Port Melbourne. Collingwood is another one. You know, they, they were just old industrial areas. They weren't – you couldn't get big trucks up and down them very easily. They were surrounded by quite expensive – residential already so that that kind of changes the outlook as well but any of those old style industrial areas I think are, are definitely worth a look and particularly for private investors because you can get in at a you know it's, it's hard for your average private investor to get in and buy a, an Amazon warehouse you know 60 70 thousand square meters but you could potentially buy panel beaters in a in an area that may undergo urban regeneration so yeah. you know, so I think that's that's definitely a consideration well you have um, you know, having a sense of some of your clients you know they they own bunnings type places and they, they they get to reasonable sort of size and scale uh, assets right you know it's not the uh, at the sort of institutional level but is there a big appetite for that sort of stuff and is that what they're chasing do you think yeah, no, it's land is one of the key decision points. Mm-hmm. Like I was on the phone to a client uh, last night. Um, we're looking at a eighteen thousand square meter land shopping centre. It had about four or five thousand square meters of building area on it. It's about twenty five percent site coverage. And one of their key decisions was we're going to pass this on to our kids. So maybe in fifty years time or thirty or ten, you could rezone or you could build up on it or increase the floor area. Like it's a genuine development opportunity but we're getting 7% net return day to day on it too. So uh, yes, it's definitely land orientated and generally that's why uh, industrial is quite popular because you're getting more bang for buck. You know, it's cheapest asset class per square meter. Like it's office is the most expensive retail in between. So um, yeah, look, it's it's very important to have land, I think, with uh, yeah. a long-term approach. And, and, and most people are still using debt to, to fund commercial assets. I, I sat down with my banker, uh, the other week, and uh, I was talking about, you know, um, financing for commercial assets, and uh, they they really like industrial at the moment. But I got a sense that they thought sort of suburban strip malls and that sort of stuff is they w- they want to stay well away from it. Um, yeah, you know, what, each... access to funding is going to be key moving to this next market. Yeah, look, it's different types of assets. Um, again, like never just said, they're all going to have different uh, risk profiles. So when you've got the supermarket, which might have a medical center on it, it might have a gym, might have you know, a bunch of restaurants on it, that is still a popular investment with a great long-term approach. Um, often they've been shopping center zoned for 50 years. You know, They've been there since 1950 and it's been rebuilt once or twice in that time. Chances are it'll be a shopping center in 50 years' time, just have different types of businesses, you know, as technology changes and consumer demand changes, there's still a need to go somewhere. Like you're not just going to sit in a house and order things online. 
that'd be awfully boring way to live. Like you must well just put some goggles on and live in a different reality. That's know? what so. they're trying to sell us at the moment. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I don't know what they can't remember what they're called these. Yeah, you live in a bubble these days, which I find quite concerning, alarming. Yeah. But do you ever read narrator on um, access to, to, to funding or innovation in funding for commercial lending moving forward? Because I know we, we again we've been getting a lot of questions around this. There's a big question mark for a lot of people. Can they access it? Is there going to be new funding from different areas? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, non, non-bank lenders are, are the growth area areas for commercial lending. I mean, if you have a look at the banks or Australian banks' exposure to commercial property, it's quite low now. It's probably only about 5% of their debt book. It's quite different to what we're seeing globally where I think the US it's kind of 11 or 12%. So I think that's the case. I was thinking about this myself. I I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's it's been interesting. I mean, it, it has been to do with the growth of non-bank lenders. So I think there was a period of time where the, the the big four started to feel that commercial was a bit tricky, it was a bit complicated. Uh, it was easier to do residential lending. It was more assured. Probably more assured. Yeah. yeah. So the debt, you know, the, I mean, if you think if you're – someone assessing someone to lend to and they've got a, you know, a house versus a, you know, a, an industrial building, you know, it's, it's really hard. They, they do need a lot of specialists in there and we have seen a lot of the specialists move out of the big four and move to the non-bank lenders. So, you know, I think that talent has really been going across for quite some time as well. So the talent from the banks that, you know, the people that really had a lot of knowledge around commercial property, a lot of them are working for the non-bank lenders and then the non-bank lenders have really grown because, as a providing debt is profitable, you know if you if you are providing debt and you can get a really decent return and a much better return than you know perhaps some other I mean, much much safer. I think it's generally seen by a lot of the non bank lenders you know that that debt is is a pretty safe way to use money and and so that's really grown that opportunity. And they're sort of accessing global dough in order to bring that in Australia to lend out to Australian real estate, so you get an exposure of international. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they all do. I mean, they, they, I mean, there's a lot of money that does want to invest in Australia and um, super funds or, or pension funds overseas are, are big ones. So they're looking at Australia really closely. Um, sovereign wealth funds are other ones as well. So, you know, there's definitely money that's targeting Australia and, and going in and, and providing funds for someone to, you know, providing debt to someone is easier for some sovereign wealth and trying to buy the property themselves. So, you know, I think that's – so they get the exposure through the debt as opposed to actually owning the property where they then have to worry about the management and all those other components. And there's also so, concerns around sort of foreign investment and other ways in which they can get all the benefits of yes, of Australian real estate uh, without uh, some of the, the, the government sort of implications of it. And we've spoken a lot about price growth and, and, and predictions for growth. Can you give me a sense for valuations within – Commercial assets, no doubt. There's been there's been a lot of write downs in in value of office space. Um, so what most mm-hmm. Australian private investors, it doesn't really have too much of an implication for them. But wh- wh- where we're going to see the the direction in there? Well, they're, they're going down. So um, the MSCI index only that's the one you know that does give us the clearer clearest idea as to what's what's happening across asset classes, and it is showing office and office and retail both declining. That's based on the listed space only and it's based on the valuations that have taken place. So industrial has come back, but it's still still increasing. So I think this year it'll it'll probably start to improve. I mean look it's hard to, it's hard to tell, but it, it it's likely it'll it'll start to improve. I think, you know, the economy is starting to get more normal. We're starting to see interest rates the outlook for interest rates change, so that that's certainly changing the outlook as well. So at the moment, yeah, not not too well, but again, you know, hard to talk about it on mass and say all properties are falling in value because you know we know with industrial the the diversity is just so so great from one location to another and one asset to another. It's, it's difficult. And you mentioned that's the listed space. Is there any sort of data yeah, houses um, out there covering? you know, unlisted properties and the, you know, the stuff that mums and dads buy? Like, is there anything out there yet that covers that on a mass level? Yeah, I mean, there we do get the transactions, but then the transactions aren't that frequent. Mm. So it does make it really hard for us to get a clear idea of what's happening. So Real Capital Analytics is, is really the best one because it tracks every single transaction. So, you know, you could look at that, but then... Yeah, it's hard to... It's still limited. Yeah. yeah, it's still quite limited. So it is it is difficult to 
yeah, commercial property values are hard, which is why commercial valuers do need to be so much more, you know, they, they do need to be so much more specialised because it is such a, a difficult thing to do. Yeah. And give us a sense for, for rents unconscious of time. Um, should there be an expectation of uh, increases over and above uh, the, the new normal where inflation will be? Not for office, so incentives are, are really high at the moment. Yeah. So office is not going to really see much rental growth. I think coming back to the construction problems, that's that's going to continue to increase rents in industrial. That's that's a clear one. We can also see it in residential. That's also a problem. Lack of housing is, is leading to rental growth. Uh, retail, again, you know, a little bit hard. I mean, it's it's not a... I mean, yeah, I think if you're looking at retail, you're probably looking at development potential. As, as you mentioned, the investor you were talking about before, what you know, what is the, the redevelopment potential? What's the yield? I mean, not everyone's looking for huge capital growth. They sometimes just want something that, that yields quite well. So, you know, I think there's, there's other considerations for shopping centres and um, location is one, type of centre is one, and, and then also what you're looking personally in, for in an, in an investment. So summarising this discussion, we're, we're marching towards, I hate the phrase, a new normal with commercial real estate. Um, once we get inflation behind us and normalised and an interest rate environment where we'll get some cuts, it'll probably stabilise for a period of time. It's not going to go back to where it was 18 months ago, but um, that's encouraging. You know, you, you don't want too many seismic shifts in and around any asset class. Uh, makes investing hard. Uh, You've got to time it uh, a lot more and it's a lot less forgiving. So we're moving into a more forgiving commercial market, Scott. You say that, there might be a, a new war or something else pop up. Who knows? But yeah, right now it looks like the, the path is clearer, that's for sure. So hence why the confidence is a bit high on general for you know most of these uh, investors we talk to. So yeah, it's uh, I guess the new norm is where the rates will end up stabilising at because uh, right now they're a little bit too high for the current yields in both resi and commercial. So if that comes down and sits at I don't know, 1, 1.5% less, then I think that will, uh, that will be a good spot for many investors who are purchasing at the current price. And do you like stability as a commercial property investor or do you like a bit of flux? Uh, I'd look, a little bit of flux for sure. Like we plan for it. Like that's why we, we look at all asset classes from child cares to even offices to, you know, industrial, like... Again, you're buying for 50 years. It doesn't matter what's happening this year. Like, I couldn't care less, to be honest. Even if rates jumped up another 3%, it would not change my opinion on what we're buying because it's not going to stay like that for, for long. So it's all noise. You know, We're buying for the long-term picture. Australia's got a, an ever-expanding population. There's more wealth being created here. We can almost immigrate our way out of recessions. Like it's, you know, We're the golden goose of the property world. So... That's what I think long term, and yeah, the noise and whatever they say on the news—that's that's just for uh, you know giggles here and there. And for you, narrator, uh, outside of joining me and Scott on inside commercial property, has been one of the highlights of your jobs. Uh, uh, what, what, why do you enjoy doing what you do so much? Uh, I guess property, property. I like property people. You know, I think everyone's—it's a very diverse crowd. You know, you've got the institutional crowd, you've got the private. So I always get to meet different people. Um, work, working across sectors as well, like the rural agents are quite different. People that own farms are quite different to someone who, who owns a childcare centre, for example. Um, so I guess that for me is, does keep it... Diversity. And also people have really strong views as well. And I, I like that too, that, mm. you know, people have strong views. They, you know, there's there's a lot happening. There's a lot of, like, talking structural change. You know, there's a lot that happens globally that affects property and, and it does keep it very interesting. As well, uh, thanks for joining us today, Nerida. It's uh, it's great to bring you. I'll have to bring you back in as uh, we try and map and uh, give some insights into how commercial and property investors can make more informed decisions. Uh, insights for you are very, very uh, valued. And uh, thanks for spending the time today with us. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. thank you so much. Nice. Uh, and Scott, um, uh, probably posing more questions for people. So, what do they need to do to chat with your mob and uh, work out what they're going to do? Uh, just email us at info at rethinkinvesting.com.au and uh, yeah, any questions, if you want to discuss your own portfolio, happy to review it and um, yeah, financing, you know, all that type of stuff. It's all, it's all in our wheelhouse and 
And next month, we're hopefully going to get uh, another one of my clients on, a um, very successful lady who's invested many times over the years, so uh, you know, International Women's Month, so just continuing the theme. And uh, yeah, there's not it's an underrepresented field, so we really want to get the world, world out and uh, encourage uh, women to sort of take control of their own finances, especially in this field, because... Uh, you do have less competition as well, you know, from an investor point of view. Everyone looks at residential. It's the default move. Mm. But this is why I think the returns are a little bit better here because, uh, you know, you, you can squeeze out a better asset. Um, there's more risk and that, you know, if you can get around the risk, that's uh, how you can make more money. So, and, and the point I would make is that you said it's it's a three to six month at least cycle to, yep. to, to take action. So if you're thinking about it, um, it's probably best to actually start. Yeah, taking action because these things do take time. Yeah, and then you don't have to rush. Take your time, get your finances sorted, and get your budgets uh, lined up. Start looking at assets in those price points. Look at a few. Eventually, you'll land on one that resonates with you, and then bang, you're a commercial yeah. owner. Yeah. Nice one. <laughs> That's uh, Inside Commercial Property Rethink Investing. Thanks for tuning in uh, and joining us online as well. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Until then, bye bye.